have a poll for pole dance <laughs> and I can see it in your videos, not just like, oh, like I'm a jogger. Like I, I jog sometimes. <laughs> like, you know, my, my, my three mile time is this, this, yeah. and this. You're like, no bitch, I pole dance and I got one in my room. <laughs> All right, welcome to Queer Talk, the number one podcast to connect you to all of your favorite queer creators and a space where we can share our stories on all things queer related. My name is Brie Walker, Brie Logan on all platforms. Uh, so with that being said, our guest on this week's episode, she hails from England. She's a TikTok creator. Um, she's got a pole. She does some pole <laughs> dancing. She has the voice of a sweet little baby angel. <laughs> um, you can find her on um, R E A one L E on TikTok. Um, please welcome Sinead Bates. Hi, thank you for having me. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, so, you're British. So are you mm -hmm. a tea person or a coffee person? <laughs> Why is it always the tea that people go for straight away? <laughs> oh, um, yeah. I'm def yeah, I'm definitely more of a tea person. Stereotypical British and all that. Um, <laughs> only Earl Grey though. I'm really particular about my tea. I don't drink coffee though. I don't know. It, it makes me really anxious. <laughs> okay. I feel the same way. Um, I can only do like half calf with coffee, but I'm mm. I ask not because just because you're British, <laughs> but I love tea. Like I'm a big okay. tea person. But which tea? Because I've I've found that there's a difference across the water, okay? Like I've uploaded pictures like vid TikToks with tea in it, and people have been like, What is that? <laughs> really? Well, yeah, people drink different tea. So you know, what tea do you drink? Yeah, I drink black tea mainly. I'll do like a lemon black tea, but I also like English breakfast tea, like the uh, uh, Twinnings. <laughs> twinings, yes. Twinings. Yes. I didn't know yes. they called it Twinings. Okay. No, it's like, I, th I like Twinnings. It's kind of cute. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds more, I feel like it sounds more British. Like Twinnings sounds just like a British, more British than Twinnings. I what? think it does, definitely. Speaking of British, then like I always hear the contrast between our accents whenever I'm speaking to anyone from America. I'm like, wow, do I really sound like that? <laughs> <laughs> to me, it's so obvious. This is why I only ever use audios on TikTok. <laughs> I didn't know that you were British until I heard you speak. And it was, uh, I think, just a story. And you were doing some activism. And so you were on the megaphone. And I was like, holy shit, she's British. I, I <laughs> thought she was American or Canadian. Yeah, most people do think that. Um, like I said, I never use my own voice when I'm doing um, videos because everyone on TikTok is American primarily, so it just stands out so much. I really don't like it. Um, <laughs> so when I ever do use my own voice, people are like, what? Like, UK? <laughs> but yeah. So, uh are you a Vikings fan? Because I see that you have the Vikings jersey, which was yet another thing of why I thought you were American because you were wearing Everyone a, a Vikings. Minnesota. Yeah. <laughs> oh no, I'm going to get grilled for this. Um, I'm actually not a Vikings fan. Um, that jersey was handed down to me by a friend okay. <laughs> and I really like it, but I do get those comments quite a lot on my videos and I don't want to disappoint people. So I'm just like, people are like, oh, Skull Vikings. And I'm like, yeah, uh, <laughs> um, I feel really bad about that, to be honest. But um, I've also got like a Lakers hoodie as well. That I also wear. So clearly I'm just one of those girls that's just like picked up random merch and I just wear anything and anything. Listen, it's comfy, okay? Like, I like it. I also like the color purple. So hey, <laughs> don't count for me, please. <laughs> I'm a Lakers fan too. I'm a Lakers fan too. So you're open on TikTok about uh, being bisexual, which is awesome. Um, and what I want to talk about is I feel like the name as well as like other identities in the queer space can mm -hmm. kind of get some backlash, like just with yeah. stereotypes. So like, have you ever had that moment where you thought, did someone seriously just say that to me? Yes. Um, <laughs> well, there's been several occasions really like when I've been um, out with my girlfriend and the, there's, there are people around me that know I'm bisexual and boys are like, oh, can I join in or something like that? And it's like, God. that is, no, you can't. <laughs> like, <laughs> that's yeah. really not how that works. Please back off. Um, <laughs> and also from um, 
gay women themselves, like lesbians especially. Um, I remember um, one girl turning around to me one time and being like, oh, um, am I just an experiment to you? Blah, 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 blah. You know, people tend to like invalidate the way that you feel about women because you are also attracted to men. Almost as if like men are like your primary aim and women are just on the side. And I'm just like, how did, how did you come to that? <laughs> um, but I just, it's really offensive because it just um, suggests that our feelings towards girls aren't real. Do you know what I mean? Or they're just kind of, uh, uh, peripheral or something like that when it's actually a lot deeper than that I agree with you um I feel like it's su it's invalidating to your queerness and it's also puts masculinity and men as like always oh, more than all women and women are always less than even it depends and it doesn't even matter if your, your preference is more towards men or more towards women it doesn't even matter you could be bisexual and be like 90 10 like 90 yeah. women and people would still be like <laughs> but you still like men though right like it's yeah. more than yeah literally even like if that's so ingrained to the point that it makes gay women feel insecure about being with you it's really worrying because it's like like how did we come to believe this but you're right it is another case of putting men on top just like how bisexual men are seen to be gay men in the closet do you know what yeah. i mean all of this is about like male desire being the highest form it's like no man it's, it's not about that <laughs> uh, exactly so it's it i think it's just more about male superiority than anything and i feel like because i identify as a lesbian mm -hmm. and i i could see where you have women who um are have you know held their own things with lesbian stereotypes and so they have their own insecurities if it if it comes to someone that not only likes women which is mm -hmm. just another thing just being jealous and insecure but then you have everyone so you have men and you have women and so yeah. it it's like an it, it's an insecure thing and maybe because it's like oh like because men have have dicks and so like, you, <laughs> yeah. we don't have those it, yeah you know I mean, I think dicks are overrated personally, but that's just me. Uh, <laughs> you're right, though. It is completely an insecurity thing. And um, the way that I look at it as well is you were already competing with other women anyway. Now you're just competing with more people. And I still chose you. So, mm -hmm. like, so at the end of the day, it's more of a compliment. I had a wider pool to choose from and it's still you. So, you know. <laughs> exactly. So I had an experience um, similar to just when people say things about, you know, your bisexuality and invalidating it. And it was recent. And I, you know, you see these things on TikTok where mm -hmm. people will, you know, put in the captions, like the different types of like shitty things they get said to them. And I was remember being like, wow, that's so awful. Like, does that really happen? I've never had that happen. And so I did, I had it happen. I was at uh, my, well, I'm at my parents now. Um, and there were some guys that were like chopping down branches and just doing some cleanup like in the yard. And this is just a weird story. There were ducklings in the, the water and I, this guy was helping me get them out because the mom was like trying to get them out of the pool. And it was a whole thing. I had like a whole story on, on, on Instagram. Um, <laughs> But he was helping me and it was great. I was so happy that he was be, like to help me with it. And so after they left, I had to give them like their check and everything. And he goes, hey, can I get your number? And I was like, I totally caught me off guard. And I was like, yeah. um, I, you know what? I'm like, I'm gay. So, and he just looks at me and he goes, you're too cute to be gay. Oh, I've heard that one. I've heard that one. <sighs> it's like, I'm sorry. Did you assume that women were only gay when they weren't attractive enough to get a man? Like, what is wrong with you? Yeah. <laughs> or how, like, it kind of suggests that, like, you're a waste, almost, as if yeah. you're doing something, like, I, I don't know. I don't understand what goes through men's heads sometimes. Um. <laughs> I, I just, and I felt like I was so not seeing that coming. I think because I just, I don't see men anymore. I don't look at them. Like, I, they're just these fucking things that are just around <laughs> you know and I yeah. and I don't look to them for validation or attention or anything like that like I used mm -hmm. to and so it, it came up so fast and I 
And I felt like I should have had more of a feminist response. Like I felt like if I had more time or had been prepared, I could have said something like witty or funny <laughs> or something. And all I could muster was just like, you know, I'm gay. And, and then he said, you're too cute to be gay. And I said, thank you. <laughs> oh no. You know what? We all have those moments though, where we wish we said something else, like whether it's about like, be gay or anything, you know, we all wish we could go back, but like, think about it like this. Now that you've had that experience, you'll think in your head, like, cause someone will say that to you again, a hundred percent, but now you'll know what to say. Like, what would you say if you had more time? Well, I wouldn't fucking say thank you. Like, thank you so much <laughs> for telling me that I'm too cute to be gay. Um, <laughs> honestly, now that I'm thinking about it, like I would have said, more sternly and been like yeah I'm gay and he and then if he said are you too cute to be gay I would have been like I'm actually not um I'm the perfect amount and uh and I don't like you <laughs> <laughs> something like that I'd have just said something like well you're too cute to be gay we're well, all too stupid to be talking but here we are you know like Ooh, <laughs> sassy that, yeah I, I like to throw attitude in there sometimes like fuck off <laughs> sassy and I, yeah, I wish I could have. And then he literally said it twice. Like, like somehow I was going to change my mind, you know? And oh, I was just like, okay, bye. Like, see you later. Yeah. And also like, if I had told them him that beforehand, would he have helped me with the ducks? Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> it's true to be fair. Sometimes. Yeah. I mean, if men are going to help you with something, you could just kind of keep it to yourself that you're gay for a little bit. And then, <laughs> yeah. I'm joking. Yeah. I just had no idea <laughs> that maybe it was contingent upon him maybe getting a date with me. I thought he just thought yeah. it was cool to like, because it was just funny. I was, there was like, t like 12 ducklings in the pool and we were getting them out with like a scooper, like the, mm. uh, like a pool scraper or whatever. And I don't know. I just thought he was like a decent human being. Now maybe that was my fatal error. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've had a lot of experiences with men like that where like, I really am, it, a lot of things are contingent on them trying to get a date with you. Mm -hmm. So me genuinely just being friendly, like I like to talk to strangers, you know what I mean? If I'm like at the train station, someone's like, oh, how's your day going? I'm like, oh, you're really well, you know you. Um, but <laughs> again, that's my naivety because in most instances, when you engage in conversation with people like that, they're like, oh, so are you single and stuff like that. And some, my, most of the time when I'm talking to people, I'm just being friendly. Do you know what I mean? And then you have to have that awkward conversation where it's like, uh, you know, yes, but no. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I am bisexual, but I don't, I'm not attracted to that many men anymore. Yeah. I don't know. It's kind of weird. I'm kind of questioning the whole thing, to be honest. But um, <laughs> So in those situations, I'm most likely going to shut someone down. Um, but I'm always, I, I always find myself in that position quite a lot, especially through my job as well, because I'm people facing and always talking to people because I'm super friendly people always mistake that for flirting and then I just end up in that same position again I hate how being nice equates to you want to fuck me yeah literally I'm like dude can I not just have like a good conversation with you <laughs> I said that once to a guy and he was like are you serious conversation and I was like okay never mind <laughs> You think that they would realize that women are very verbal creatures mm. and maybe because they just are more physical and like, there's just, there, there's some differences between men and women and like men are typically more, um, imagery based, right? Very visually based. Women are more verbally based. Mm. So you think that they'd fucking catch on at some point that we like to talk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess so. I guess so. But sexuality is so weird like um just figuring out like who you like why you like them how much you like them and how it mm -hmm. changes over time and evolves and like I had such a hard time with like just using certain labels and then not using them anymore and feeling mm -hmm. like well was I ever that label and my thought process was yeah I was like because I came out at foot well first I thought I was bisexual because I had had a few relationships with men and I had like actually liked them in, in all capacities, but it was very minimal now. Now that I have had some time, I'm like, oh, mm -hmm. that's maybe like a five to 10% chance. And like, even though I still have attraction to them, I don't want to 
date them probably and I definitely don't want to marry them but it's weird like I was like oh I'm not straight but I never liked the term lesbian because of all the connotations and all of the stereotypes and so I was like I I feel like I'm bisexual but I didn't like that label either because it it had a label of being like over sexualized and all about and 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 all of these things about being greedy and like all this shit. And I was like, well, that's, I don't want that. And mm-hmm. so I was like, okay, queer is a really good word. I like that. So I'm going to go with that. And when I led with that, people were like, what, what is that? What is queer? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, I didn't know what queer meant initially when um, I first started like branching out in my sexuality and things like that. I had to Google it and ask people. Um, but did it work for you? Because I guess it's just quite broad, isn't it? And it's quite flexible. It, it is. And I kind of like the broadness of it because you have like, oh, I'm straight, oh, I'm gay. Mm-hmm. Um, and I feel like queer is more of a, an overarching kind of label that like all queer people can use, like non-binary mm-hmm. people, trans people, like anybody who's under you know whatever like pay in by lesbian all of that stuff mm-hmm. like can use the word freely and I also just didn't really identify with any of the other labels and just had these internal biases toward them and was still working through my own shit and so I yeah. really just like the openness of it and a lot of and I like the newness and the how they took back the word because it used to be a derogatory term and so like mm-hmm. I watched YouTubers and I and some just like I, I guess you'd call them celebrities, but, um, and we're using the term and I was like, oh, wow, like they're very intellectual. They're, they're woke. Like I, I like that term. I'm going to use it. And mm-hmm. I liked it. It was just weird coming out as that because I, I came, when I came out to my parents, they were like, what? <laughs> yeah. What exactly what do you mean by that? Yeah. Um, um, and they didn't like the word. They were like, well, I don't want to say that. I don't like that word. And I was like, well, I, it's, it's a fine word to use now. I know that like maybe in your day, it wasn't a good word to use. Mm-hmm. Like you can't like, you know how you can't say like fag anymore. In fact, it was never a good word, but like it was, a, it was not appropriate, but like technically okay by normal society 10 years ago. Mm-hmm. And um, even though I explained that I, that we'd taken back the word, it's a, it's a good word to use. They, mm-hmm we're not having it and so like they used <laughs> they used bisexual they, they were, like they told my grandparents and everything they're like yeah she's bisexual because they're like they're not gonna get queer we don't even get it and I was like Ugh. all right <laughs> yeah there's definitely like much less of an understanding of it outside of the queer community um I think even now like people our age if you said oh like oh she's queer they'd be like in what way do you know what I mean like how weird is she how weird is she (laughs) yeah as in they probably want you to categorize it further but for some people it's a case of not wanting to do that so yeah but does it still work for you yeah I still like the term I actually just when I got on TikTok and I was Mm -hmm. seeing all of these um empowered queer people that were just living their lives in these awesome videos. And especially with the people identified as lesbian, I was like, like I, it's, it helped me dismantle all of the negative biases that I had associated with it that were just indoctrinated Mm -hmm. into me as I, as a young child. And, and so I was like, yeah, I I am a lesbian. I like that label. I'm going to use that label. And so I've, been able to kind of disintegrate that because of the community on TikTok, which I'm super grateful for. That's really beautiful. That's such yeah. a positive effect for it to have had. Yeah. Um, I hear a lot of people say things like that, that like seeing people being so openly gay on TikTok helps them feel more comfortable with it. Like um, I get a lot of um, Instagram DMs from people that have come through my TikTok and there's like been like, oh, like I'm, I'm closeted, but like seeing like all these videos like really helps. Like, um, I get a lot of questions as well about things like that, um, about um, being okay with the labels and um, coming to terms with it and things like that. Um, So I think a lot of people have the same experience as you in the sense that it really just uh, guides them a little bit. Um, And 
the people that are in my inbox sometimes ask me things about like um, coming out and being closeted and things like that. Um, which, you know, it's nice that people feel like they can ask me those kind of things. And I'm sure they do that with lots of other creators as well. Um, but yeah, it's nice that the queer community has kind of found a safe space in that sense. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, when it comes to your um, bisexuality and kind of coming to terms with that, um, how did that come about? And like, how is it still evolving now? Because I, I know that you had touched on, you're kind of like, I don't know, I think I like girls more, <laughs> but I'm not sure. So like, how, how is that coming about for you? Um, it's, it's confusing for me at the moment, because um, I'm told from two angles on one angle that it's internalized by phobia. It's like, you're constantly thinking that you're like, you've got this imposter syndrome, like, no, I must be a lesbian or no, I must be straight. You're always like questioning either side of your attraction because you just kind of don't believe in it yourself to just be bisexuality. But then on the other side, um, <laughs> there are people saying, no, it's a compulsory heterosexuality that's still ingrained in you. Like you think that you're supposed to be attracted to men which is why you think you kind of still are, but primarily you're attracted to women. You're a lesbian, but you just don't know how to come to terms with that. And I'm like, oh God, this is a lot really, isn't it? Um, <laughs> yeah, but it is. Um, so, I, but it's not really something that I stress out about too much because at the end of the day, like we were saying earlier, sexuality is so fluid and it's not like a black and white thing. Like you are this label. So you think this, you felt this, so you have to be this. Like at the moment, I'm more comfortable um, describing myself as bisexual because I still feel attraction to men sometimes. I think it's more of like a look but don't touch thing though. I don't know. <laughs> anyway. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but that makes sense for me right now. Do you know what I mean? It's the same kind of thing that I say for when people ask me about the pansexuality versus bisexuality thing. I'm like, there are a lot of crossovers, but like ultimately it's about the label that you feel comfortable with. Um, come into terms with it when I was younger see for me it was different because I kind of bypassed you know the really awkward teen st teen stage where you realize that you're gay and like I see this with so many other people and I'm like huh I never had this experience because I didn't know until I was like 19 18 I'm gonna say um don't get me wrong there were signs there were very clear signs um <laughs> but um, I didn't actually realize until this girl that I'd been flirting with for a while turned around and went hey do you think you might be gay and then suddenly it went I was like, what? It's like, oh my God, that makes so much sense. It's like, I'm bisexual. I was like, how have I never noticed this before? But <laughs> it was never like a, oh my God, what am I gonna do? Because I was already, I'd already established like a solid sense of identity because I was 18 years old, you know what I mean? So it didn't scare me. I was like, oh, this is great, cool. One more thing to put on the list. Um, but kind of have like a sense of guilt in that sense. Cause I know people go through a lot in their teenagers to come to terms with their sexuality. Um, but I was, for the most part, okay. So for you, it was just kind of like a, somebody, it, all it took was someone to just say, ask you if you were gay. And then you're like, in your head, you're like, yes, yes, bitch. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, so it was this girl that I worked with, basically. And she was a lesbian. And oh my God, she was so hot. I really hope she never hears this. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and she, so, but spoke very openly about being gay and the people we were all on like a team and people asked her about it a lot and stuff like that um but I was like really attracted to her and she liked me as well so it was a lot of back and forth kind of banter kind of thing we're flirting with each other um and yeah and then she just asked me one time she was like girls a little bit because she knew that up until that point I identified as straight you know what I mean but <laughs> wasn't acting it um <laughs> so yeah that's all that really had to happen she asked me and then I realized so she knew she she had she had some gay vibes going for you. <laughs> yeah, she knew before I did, which was crazy. Um, but once I knew, I kind of looked back at previous experience and how I'd felt in certain situations, and I was like, D "How did, did you really not know?" <laughs> um, yeah, a lot of things make more sense now. Like uh, when I was younger, I remember uh, one of like a close female friend of mine got a boyfriend when I was about fifteen. And I was not happy, like, <laughs> at all. <laughs> uh, I knew that I really, really, really liked this girl and that it was different to the other girls, but I didn't, like, understand it as attraction because it didn't feel the same as how I did with boys, do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah. 
but yeah I was really mad when she got a boyfriend and then obviously when all this came out now I understand why um but yeah <laughs> I've definitely had that and I've also had that with just friends that I was not attra- like attracted to at all um them it, it was almost like because I was so closeted and this was even before I came out to myself and I, and now I, looking back, I understood why I was so like angry because I, mm-hmm. you know, cause I didn't understand why I was so triggered. Like with, if I had, like I, you know, with my older sister, she got a boyfriend and like, and she was uh, a junior in, no, she was a freshman in high school and I was a set in seventh grade and I was so jealous, so jealous I had a couple friends who had done that and like, yeah, they were kind of all consumed and like bailed and stuff like that, which sucks. But I was like on another level mad and I was still carried that same like type of anger, even with roommates in college who would have, and I like their boyfriends, like, and I'm not like, you're like a jealous person, envious person. But when it came to those things, I think I was so repressed and so like unconsciously angry that I couldn't um, date and like I was going through the motions even though I didn't realize it and like I wasn't having those full experiences that they were having mm-hmm. and it and it pissed me off <laughs> <laughs> you know it's crazy. yeah no I can understand that um but it wasn't attraction at all no no not with a majority of them I think it was just because mm-hmm. they I was jealous that they were able to do the things that I wasn't able to do Mm-hmm. Um, but then I did have some where I did have some, a few crushes in that. I was just like, Oh, like this boy likes them. Like they can, this boy's gonna not going to treat them like I am. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Well, I sometimes question my past crushes sometimes, uh, with boys, because this is another thing with my, me gathering evidence for my sexuality and stuff like that. It's an like, ongoing. Okay, we're a fucking detective. Like, let's. Yeah. <laughs> it's like an ongoing investigation of my sexuality, which is basically what being bisexual is. You're always questioning it. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, like, I think about some of the crushes I've had on boys in the past. I'm like, yeah, but is that real? Like, did you really feel like strong emotions towards them like you have for women? Like, um especially like in the bedroom as well it's like did you even like engage as much and things like that like I'm always thinking about it and trying to compare Mm -hmm. but I think at the end of the day I just have to come to the conclusion that there's nothing to figure out (laughs) do you know what I mean like at the end of the day I think I've just liked both of them at the moment I'm definitely swaying more towards girls but you know in a few years time I could swerve back again and stuff like that you know you never know yeah you really never know I you know, since like, because I've been out for a few years now, and it it was kind of like I flipped a switch, and I was just like all consumed with women, and I like didn't see men and everything like that. But then mm-hmm. there was one that I did see. I I don't know, maybe he's gonna listen to this, but uh, <laughs> it and it kind of came out of nowhere. I got a I had a new job, and so it, it we had like a, a happy hour. Um, And so it just kind of like, I was talking to everybody, I was new, you know, and we just kind of got into this really good conversation again (laughs) with the fucking conversations and it just kind of came out of nowhere. And I was just like, huh, Uh, do I, do I like you? Do I like you as a friend? I don't, I can't tell. mm -hmm. And, and I, and then I got really drunk and I told some of my coworkers, I'm like, I have a crush on him and they're like are are, but what like you just like but you came out to us like like a couple weeks ago and like and there's like this look on their face was like puzzled and I was like but I'm puzzled too like I don't know (laughs) we're all confused okay (laughs) like god um how does that like affect you and your labeling then because if you still experience attraction towards men like how do you like process that that's a good question. I didn't, I, it's not that I question my labels. Um, mm-hmm. I still very firmly identify as queer and, and now as, as uh, a lesbian. Um, and I had to think, is this because of compulsory heterosexuality? It, or is this because I, I was thinking like, do I really like him or do I just like him as a friend? Okay. What if I just like him as a friend? Is that because I have written off all men 
it, and now I feel like if I go back and, and date, like this is the exception, then I'm losing all of the stuff that I have gone through and every mm -hmm. part of my identity, is that going to be erased if I decide to engage and, and date this guy who is part mm -hmm. of heteronormative culture, even though like he's woke. But, mm -hmm. and then another thing was, well, what if I, if, what if I do like him? Like, I really like him. Like we fall in love. And what if he doesn't like the more masculine sides of me that I would have no problem with, with women? Mm -hmm. What if he feels threatened by those kind of things? What if like he like when I want to dress maybe more tomboy or a little more masculine, what if he's not attracted to me? Like in all of these things, like what if I think that he's going to be this like woke person and then I find out that he's actually not and he's actually mm -hmm. kind of still in the throes of, of that and, and then it, and I'm deeply hurt by it. Mm -hmm. I understand so. that. Yeah, that is a risk, I guess, you take with boys, um, especially ones that aren't really like, in the queer community and things like that. Um, one thing I would say though about your identity, like being in a heteronormative relationship doesn't like affect your identity at all. Like it shouldn't. Um, if I was like to date a boy next week and like, um, I don't know, I made like a TikTok video with him and they're all like, oh my God, you know what I mean? Like I'm, I'm still as queer as I was before. And so would you be? Yeah. And you're completely right. I think it's just the uh, the insecurity of like, I, I worked so hard to get here. And then mm -hmm. people wouldn't realize that I was gay if I mm -hmm. was with him unless they knew me and knew my background. Or, mm -hmm. And then I would, feel, I, I would feel like I would have to make it known. Like even though mm -hmm. I'm in a, like I'd have to make it known by, make, by just, you know, saying anecdotal things or telling stories. So then mm -hmm. people would do that. And I know you can't control people's perceptions, but like, I don't want to be like the, the token gay person. Um, and I wouldn't want to be like the, oh, like she's cool because she's fucked girls and now you get need to date her. And like, yeah. just like those kind of things. And, and then like feeling like I have to be more feminine even though I don't because of those mm -hmm. so there's just a lot of like stuff that I feel like I'd have to work through to be mm -hmm. able to to do that to make sure that like my identity isn't being erased or I feel like it is I know no, that not. that makes a yeah. lot of sense that makes a lot of sense <clears throat> like I understand what you mean since if I dated a boy I would definitely feel like even though I shouldn't I feel less like I was part of the LGBTQ community and that's that is part of my identity now. And I don't, I wouldn't like that either. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Even though like I wouldn't become straight, I feel straight and I look straight. It made me really <laughs> uncomfortable. <laughs> so yeah. no, like, where are the rainbows? <laughs> and I, I think it just goes with evolving and being more okay with it. Um, and i maybe if I balanced it out and just had a bunch, cause I don't have like a lot of queer friends. I have like a few and so, like, if I had ha had, like, a huge queer, like, community and friend base, maybe I'd be okay with doing that or exploring that. But, like, to be honest, I don't even know if I actually like him like him or if I if he's just, like, a woke, like, attractive dude that I, like, just would want to hang out with platonically. Mm -hmm. I, I'd, and I don't know if I want to get into it to, to figure it out. It just seems like this insurmountable goal that's just, like, exhausting. Like, it just seems exhausting at this point. Yeah. That's, that really makes a lot of sense. I find with some boys, I think I'm attracted to them. And then I realize I actually just want to be them. Like, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. I'm like, you're cool. Like I was, uh, I, what happened? I was at the supermarket and a group of boys walked past me a week ago and there was one. And I thought I was attracted to him. I was looking at him. He had his little swagger on like alpha male kind of thing. Looking all good. And I was like, wow, was you're like, so cute. Yeah. yeah. And I was like, no. I just want to be that confident and have that much of an impact when I walk into a room. <laughs> it's not that I'm attracted to you. I just like admire your traits and want to take them on myself. Do you know what I mean? So, yeah. I feel that way too. Um, and that, that also gets in the way of attraction. You're like, do I want to be them? Or do <laughs> I actually want to have sex with them or both? And yeah. <laughs> if it's both, it's a bit weird as well. <laughs> yeah. And a lot of the time it is because you're wanting that confidence. Like, like, can we all have a confidence of like the average bass drummer in like a shitty in a shitty band? Like, can we be the have the like the 
the confidence of just a white Chad because I would love to have that confidence. <laughs> You know, maybe not be called Chad though. I don't like that name. Yeah, I fucking hate. I use that name <laughs> sarcastically. I use Chad and Brad on any of my videos. If I'm talking about white, straight cis men, it's Chad and Brad. That's so American. <laughs> Chad and Brad. <laughs> what would you say here? Um, obviously, we say Becky for girls, but for boys, uh, Bradley. No, that's what you said. I don't know. I don't know what the the, the UK ones are. I can't think of them right now. <laughs> Um, I don't know, like maybe like a Josh or like a Josh, maybe, yeah. So speaking of kind of that toxic masculinity with the Chads and the Brads, I want to talk about something on TikTok that I feel like needs to be talked about more. And it's the whole concept of tops and bottoms in the queer community, specifically with just queer women. You know, Mm -hmm. because gay men have always had tops and bottoms, but somehow tops and bottoms have made their way into (laughs) queer women's lives. And all of these, um, like, TikTok celebrities who are younger, like Mm -hmm. 16, 17, 18, even in their early 20s, are just, like, carrying these top and bottom stereotypes. Um, Mm -hmm. Do you believe tops and bottoms, or do you think it's a myth? I think it's important not to like invalidate and label that anyone wants to give themselves. So if someone wants to call themselves a top or a bottom, that's fine. My issue with it comes with the way that it's applied to everyone. Like if you want to use that to ex- like explain how you interact in the bedroom, then fine. But understand that it is how you interact in the bedroom. Like I feel like girls are walking around calling themselves tops, but it's like a way to like, uh paint themselves as like uh dominant and superior in everyday life and that's fine have that kind of confidence but it can kind of come across a little bit arrogant sometimes and quite cocky um especially on the app and the way that they like address bottoms uh quotes as well um they're definitely painted to be like everyone who's not them is passive submissive not just not in the bedroom everywhere do you know what i mean that um and i just think it's really it's really damaging and I did one video um about how when you're um constantly like portraying like um femmes as like passive and um just submissive all you're doing is like perpetuating the um understanding of male as superior a lot of people also is like um conveying tops is also masculine as well like that you get femme tops as well um so we kind of getting a bit stuck in this dichotomy um which I don't think does any service to anyone like I think tops and bottoms can exist but they're not the the whole lesbian community is not divided into tops and bottoms I agree completely and to the point when we were talking about um just biphobia and people thinking that you're more into men than women and for gay men that are, or by men that are more always supposed to be gay and mm. not, um, and not into women. It's putting that masculinity um, as superior over femininity just in general. And mm. so like that, and I agree with you because tops and bottoms, it's an in the bedroom thing. And I think it's just about the language that we use because when people think of bottoms, they think of, oh, they're, they are more into receiving, like they want to receive Mm -hmm. and tops are more into giving, which Mm -hmm. is completely valid. Like sometimes you sway either way. Sometimes you're more of a giver than a receiver. Um, I know that some people are like, don't want to be given anything. They just want to receive. And some people are hello princesses, you know, that term and (laughs) they they just only want to receive. And I Mm -hmm. think that's fine to know what you like and what you don't like. But to, to put it towards, oh, I have top energy, so that therefore I'm more masculine, I'm alpha, like mm. you know, all of that stuff. And it and then like even though the videos are funny, like they are damaging because it's it's saying that bottoms are less than because they're maybe more feminine, which there are so many like dominant femmes and so mm. many, um, I don't know if I want to say submissive, but that there's a lot of, you know, 
masculine women that like to receive more than mm-hmm. they like to give. And like, there's, so I think that there's this difference between giving and receiving in the bedroom and mm-hmm. how you present masculine or feminine and the, um, the value that we put to either one. Absolutely. I completely agree with how you put that. Like it really should be restricted to language that we use to like communicate bedroom preferences. Like, like you said, the problem comes when the hierarchy of it is built. It shouldn't be a hierarchy. It's just a way of communicating. Um, and it's just the really like air of arrogance that seems to come from this whole top energy thing. It's just so, um, it is damaging. And like people did reply to the video that I made. Some people, very few, um, who said, oh, but it's just a joke. I'm like, yeah, but a lot of things are just a joke, but like the language that we use, oh my God, I really love cats. I'm sorry. <laughs> you can't see because this, if you're listening to this, I just picked my cat up because he just opened my door because he opens doors. <laughs> and I wanted to show him. Oh, what's his name? His name's Milo. Oh, Milo. <laughs> I'm just going to put him down and he's okay. knocking over everything. Okay. Keep going. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> okay. No, is, is Milo okay? Priority number one. <laughs> yes. He's okay. Okay. Some people are saying it's just a joke, but at the end of the day, jokes are how we construct our reality. Our language is how we construct our reality. Do you know what I mean? Yes. If you let a man walk around making misogynistic jokes all the time, as much as they're just jokes, they kind of like, they set up the dynamic for the wider world because that's yeah. how we're talking about it. So I think we really need to be careful of these kind of structures that we're building in the queer community because they could start to mirror the damaging ones from the straight community that we're trying to avoid. Yeah, I completely agree with you on that. So I wanted to kind of segue into like what's happening on TikTok because you had made a video about um, shadow banning with people of color and queers. And so like, do you think that it is happening within the algorithm itself? Or do you think that it's the humans on the app and their own biases towards people in these groups and whether or not they're double tapping, commenting, sharing, tagging, if you're in one or both of these groups? Hmm. I'm not sure. I think it's definitely a mixture of both um, because the type of tags that you use sometimes can affect how much your videos are seen. Um, Obviously, your um, your For You page on TikTok is very much what you make it. the for you page in its default setting is very white and heteronormative. You have to actively seek out creators of color and like their videos for TikTok to be like, oh, you know, she likes black people, she likes indigenous people. And then suddenly they'll start showing up on your feed. But you have to do that first. You have to show the algorithm what you want to see. Um, but that being said, um, after instances like the blackout, for example, Um, where we went to a particular extent to try and uh, elevate black voices on the app. Um, Most, if not all, of the black creators that I follow um, complain that after participating in the blackout, their videos, their views were just went straight down afterwards, almost as if their uh, their videos were being suppressed. So I do think it is a mixture of both, um, because the same thing happened... um, with the queer community when we were trying to organize virtual brides. I'm not sure if you I know you know about that. Um, it's when um, one of the creators, Kiara, um, organized a lot of the um, queer creators to come together to create a lot of content for Pride over TikTok as opposed to coming together physically because of coronavirus. Um, but in the week leading up, the creators that um, had organized this found that their, all of their accounts had been shadow banned and they weren't able to go live anymore. Um, And, you know, when you're not able to go live, that's a clear indication that this has been done with intention. Do you know what I mean? Um, Yeah. And then there was also the issue with the Black Lives Matter hashtag. Um, I'm not sure if you heard about this one either, but it was showing up as zero views underneath when you try to use it for a few days, almost as if to stop people, to prompt people not to use it. So if you use it, then it won't get any, your video won't get any views. was picked up and then um, it blew up on Twitter, the fact that that was happening. And then TikTok released a statement afterwards saying, oh yeah, no, it was an accident, blah, 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 blah. But the fact that um, racial videos that talk about um, 
racism or just like general social justice issues are taken down before violating community guidelines, air quotes again, if you're listening. Um, <laughs> whereas uh, videos that are like actively racist stay up. It's difficult to say that TikTok doesn't have some kind of agenda. Do you know what I mean? Um, yeah. So yes, it is very much like our, like um, the onus is on us to go out and find creators of diversity, but at the same time, there are clear examples of when the app itself has tried to suppress that kind of content, whether it's just because it's political or because it's creators of color, I don't know. But um, I have heard um, through the video that you were referring to where they were saying like, um, where I was saying that we get shadow banned um, people were commenting underneath saying, yeah, it's um, like um, people who are of heavier weights as well tend to like, if you're like visually larger, um, your videos can get taken down. Disabled creators as well. If you're visually disabled, your videos can get taken down. Um, I mean, these are all just stories that I'm being told from people in the comments, but you know, these are people this is happening to. So um, I know that TikTok is really trying to address that at the moment because they've released a statement saying that they're going to bring on a diversity council um, and try and do better for the people on the app, basically. Um, but if it's going to be enough, remains to be seen. <laughs> yeah, I had no idea <clears throat> that um, that was going on. Like, I had no idea that the Black Lives Matter hashtag was being suppressed and the people that were doing virtual pride. I had heard about virtual pride, but after the fact, on the one hand, you have, okay, like sometimes your videos do really well and then sometimes they kind of flop, but if they really flop is like the thing, right? I wonder if those creators had videos that honestly sucked or if they literally mm -hmm. had views that were just so suppressed that they were like oh, like why it, even if yeah. they didn't have a video taken down yeah um obviously there's always the possibility of the video itself just being awful you know what i mean um but i think in these instances they were talking about like um because these creators of virtual pride for example have what like 80 to 100,000 followers and mm -hmm. to be on zero views for an hour after you've posted is really like out of the ordinary it just yeah. doesn't make any sense if you've got that many followers so it'll stay on zero for like an hour and then just go up really 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 slowly um and when you've got that mass of a following it just shouldn't be like that no because there's enough people who already see you already see it you're right um I know there is a new algorithm update to where you don't get that burst like you usually do. It's more like a 24 to 72 hour thing, but I definitely agree with you. I think it's got a lot to do with not just the videos that are taken down, but the videos that are left up. Like I said, like you can see some horrendous shit on that app. Things that are so like anti-gay, anti-black, like anti-everything. Do you know what I mean? Um, just outright racist, bigoted stuff that stays up absolutely fine. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So it's, it's more, the case builds when you combine all these things together and it's like, well, this, you, just look at this app, you know? Um, and yeah. I get freedom of speech. I understand that. But when your freedom of speech is literally infringing on people's rights and those are being mm -hmm. left up and the other ones that aren't infringing on people's rights, the other ones that are coming from groups that have been suppressed for mm -hmm. decades or hundreds of years, it just doesn't make any sense to me. Mm -hmm. No, it doesn't. And like I said, that's why it, that's why it seems agenda driven. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Not like they've got this massive conspiracy to do something, but like just that they don't want certain people of certain voices to have a platform. And that's really disappointing because TikTok has a lot of people from marginalized groups you know what i mean the queer mm -hmm. community on tiktok is huge you know the black community mm -hmm. on tiktok is huge yeah so to turn around and shun them like that it's like what are you doing like <laughs> we're paying your bills the hell yeah <laughs> yeah it's really interesting just because of social media in general and how like instagram's algorithm works and how tiktok's algorithm works it does show you things that you like because it wants you to stay on the app right and so their focus is different from creators focus because they they want people to stay on the app they want people to keep using it because they have advertising well not on tiktok but it, it there is some advertising now 
but they want people to stay on because they want to make money and they're, they want their advertisers to stay happy. And that's with YouTube too. So their algorithm wants to show you things that you like, but if what you like isn't diverse, then it's not going to help your evolution as a person to mm -hmm. see people who um, are disabled, to see people who are um, people of color, to see queer people, to just to see anything different. It, it's, mm -hmm. it's going to be a lot harder. And so I feel like there has, I hope this diversity council does something where they do that most of the time because they, they have to, to keep the app running and to, you know, but they, I, there has to be some point where they start to integrate um, videos that can help break down those barriers. Definitely. Cause otherwise people are just going to stay in their own lane the whole time and they yeah. won't even know, you know, um, yeah. someone commented on another one of my videos before and they were like, Oh, um, I looked at my sister's for you page, um, her sister's straight and cisgender and it was so different like <laughs> yeah. um because the suggestion was that like um black people see queer people see indigenous people as if we've all kind of been like herded together in like a corner and uh, yeah. someone called it shadow talk I was like that's quite funny I quite <laughs> like that <laughs> we're all in shadow talk and um so yeah none of the the um straight white people actually know we exist because they only see each other on their for you pages mm -hmm. and I was like, crazy can you imagine <laughs> the only yeah. time they see us is when we cross over and like I've had videos cross over that have mm. kind of like not some of the videos that gone have gone 80 to 100k for me have been like some niche ones but mm. then I've had crossover because I've I have this like thing where I do the it's a remix and I have like a family <laughs> member in the background and literally all I say is it's a remix and I just go like this <laughs> Um, and it always says like, you know, when your dad wanted a son, we got a lesbian, when you're all of that. Oh, and, yeah, yeah. and straight people fucking love that shit. Like I get so many comments about like with straight people that are saying, I love this. Like my daughter's gay or like, oh, like your grandpa's so cute and like all yeah. this stuff. But I also get a lot of the hate on those videos because they're crossover videos. So that's yeah. like, I've gotten some like heinous shit. Like I did a video because somebody said, like, um, your mom should have aborted you. And so I did a video on it and I was like, when you think that, uh, conservatives are the only homophobes, but you realize there's some pro-choice ones too. Cause like, it, what are you going to do? Like, I think this shit yeah. is funny. Like you really think that like, and people come for them too. Like the gays mm -hmm. come out in the comments and they're like, you don't talk about her like that. I'm sure you have that stuff too, but they, they're like, we're taking you under our wing. Like you're right. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I think there is a sense of community with the gays on TikTok. Um, I actually don't feel like I've gotten hate yet before, which is nice, which is, but when you get hate, you've made it. So, you know, oh, when those yeah. comments start coming in, I'm like, oh my God, guys. I like to thank my mom, my dad, my cat. Because like, <laughs> you crossed over. You crossed over and you're uh, on somebody's page and they're so triggered by you that they go yeah. in the comments and they comment something mean and then they keep commenting, which just helps you boost your video. So I would never yeah. tweet or block any of these people. Like, they're helping me. Like, your haters, yeah. I think like haters help you more than you're like really strong, loyal, like following and fan base because they <laughs> hate you more than your people who love you, love you. They are pushing your analytics way up. Like I made a Black Lives Matter, another Black Lives Matter video a couple of days ago. And uh, of course you've got people like, oh, well, all lives matter, blah, 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 blah. Oh, I'm like, let's discuss. Uh, <laughs> but the more people that do that, that feel like triggered, like you said, and just like feel the need to comment and be like, oh, black lives don't matter. I got a few of those as well. By the way, which is just attention seeking because there's the only reason you'd seek out a black lives matter video and comment black lives don't matter is because you're trying to start a fight. Yeah. And personally, I think the kind of person who gets out of bed to do that in the morning has to have a very sad life. So I just yeah. think it's funny. I'm like, okay. Like, <laughs> I mean, no one's actually going to think like, you say that and I'm just gonna laugh at you because it's stupid <laughs> yeah it's yeah. and most of the time it's not even intellectual and in most of the time it has fucking spelling errors if you're gonna say something <laughs> to me at least have the decency to have good fucking spelling 
I know, right? <laughs> so I know like a preparation of black culture, it's been happening for, I mean, as long as black people have been oppressed. And, but with queer culture, since queer culture, I guess, kind of started probably in the 50s-ish or so, um, when did you see cultural appropriation happening on TikTok within the queer community? And like, what are some examples? Because I only know of one happening with like the um, butches and studs. And a lot of people made videos on saying, hey, stud is for um, people of color. Mm -hmm. But is there anything else? Because I didn't know that. First of all, I literally thought um butches and studs were just masculine women and studs were just more stylish <laughs> which is <laughs> kind of true still <laughs> i personally don't feel like that's a massive issue um okay. to like for studs to be used outside of like people of color because personally i think um cultural appropriation is more for things that are like more strongly symbolic of race um mm -hmm. And I think you can kind of get into a habit of gatekeeping with certain things when you kind of take that a little bit too far sometimes. I just don't think it's damaging really for um, white butch lesbians to use that word. That's just my opinion though. Okay. Um, but don't cancel me. Um, <laughs> but yeah, because I was reading about um, the history behind like subculture and stuff like that. Um, and I get that it did come from the black community. Like, eyebrow cuts um someone asked me a set, same question recently um it like um they messaged me on instagram said oh did you know it came from the black hip-hop community is it okay if i have one this was um a white girl who was speaking to me and i did some reading on it and um i was like yes it did come from the black community but eyebrow cuts are not symbolic of our cultural heritage do you know what i mean yeah and there's my understanding of cultural appropriation is when it's like a, a spiritual sy symbol or something like that that has like a lot of like uh, value um, and it's taken out of context and cheapened and used superficially or something that um, what a minority culture has that the majority culture um, takes but isn't looked down upon for whereas the minority culture would have been if I have an eyebrow cut I'm looked down for it. You're going to be looked down for it too. Do you know yeah. what I mean? So I yeah. don't think that's appropriate. We, we're both going to be looked down on for the eyebrow cuts. So I don't personally see that as appropriation. Um, I don't want that as a term to be overused um, for everything because again, I think it can just become gatekeeping and I just yeah. don't think that's really useful because then when we are talking about serious things of cultural appropriation, it's not going to have as much of an effect. Yeah. Um, if we've applied it to everything thus far what was the original question that you asked me because i've gone off on a tangent completely <laughs> no you're fine i love that answer yeah i remember now so okay. um, i think the question you're asking me is in relation to um one of my tea videos where i said that a lot of um the things that we call queer culture are just stylized black stereotypes mm -hmm. so the reason why i made that video was because i kind of noticed that a lot of the way that stereotypical uh, effeminate gay men behave is kind of marked off this um, stereotypes of black women. Mm -hmm. um, so in the, I can't really, I have to kind of give an example here. Um, <laughs> so if I'm behaving in a way that's like, like Reese over attitude, I'm like period this, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. Like, am I, am I acting black or am I acting gay? And why do they look the same? Do you know what gotcha. I mean? Yeah. Um, and it really was, I put in the um, caption as well. This is an observation because I don't know how this happened, why it happened mm -hmm. and where it comes from or how I feel about it, do you know yeah. what I mean? Um, but then I did some more research on it because I Googled it a few times. I was like, why do effeminate gay men kind of mirror black women? Yeah. Um, and then um, someone actually said to me, one of my friends, they were like, oh, it's probably from ballroom culture. And I was like, right, that makes sense now. Because you know, like in the New York scene, um, the underground ballroom culture where uh, it was, uh, trans black women and gay African Americans and Latinos who'd come together for these like voguing and dance competitions and stuff like that. So it was like the queer community and the black community coming together at that time for like a um, like a kind of solidarity kind of thing. Um, and there would have been a lot of crossover with um, mannerisms and things like that. They would have merged there 
Yeah. And it probably came more from there as opposed to one copying the other because they both came together at that point. Um, so that was a learning point for me as well. Now I know that's probably why there's so much similarity between the stereotypes of both. Um, but yeah, it was really interesting because once you, once you see it, you can't unsee it. Um, <laughs> yeah. So whenever I was looking at gay men, I was like, we are acting like black women, you know? Um, but yeah, I think that's where it came from. It came from ballroom culture. I never knew about ballroom culture and I'm going to look it up after this podcast. Make Watch Pose po- on Netflix. Pose. <laughs> yes. I have seen it and I haven't watched it yet, but it was something it's on my list. It's on my Netflix list. Okay. So another video that you posted, which I really loved, um, and it got a lot of positivity in the comments was, um, like a pretty vulnerable, vulnerable video where you were talking about mental health and kind of highlighting some struggles that you've had with eating disorders. So could you kind of tell me a little bit about what made you post that video? Like what was kind of going through your mind when you were kind of creating that? Firstly, when you're using that app so often, you start to think in audios. It's really weird. So Mm -hmm. (laughs) like you'll apply, you'll be thinking about something and you'll apply an audio that you heard to the situation. And um, the audio that I use where it says, oh, I guess you're wondering where I've been. I was thinking about how, because uh, being in lockdown has been really difficult for me in the beginning because I used to have bulimia quite a few years. Um, and I'm out the other side now, like, it's fine. But in situations where I feel like I'm completely out of control and where, like, I'm kind of, uh, I feel like I'm being forced to gain weight because I can't go and do my usual things, mm-hmm. it can kind of rear its head a little bit. Um, and I was thinking about that one day and the audio just came into my head, I guess you're wondering where I've been. And it was more, it was more for the sake for uh, me making a lighthearted joke about it kind of gave me a sense of power over it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, if I laugh, I can laugh at this so I can make it smaller. Mm-hmm. Um, and I also thought, I was kind of curious to see if anyone could relate to it. I was very surprised at the level of people who could, if I'm yeah. honest. I was expecting like it to be very, very small video, like like 200 likes, something like that. But a lot of people underneath were like, oh yeah, like totally get you. And what was really beautiful for me as well was the fact that people DM me on Instagram, like I've been through the same thing, if you ever want to talk about it, blah, blah, blah. Um, and eating disorders are very, can be very lonely things. So to like, to have that from people, was was really really beautiful um but yeah I only really uploaded the video like for the sake of it um and to, yeah. for my own like benefit but it was so nice to see that other people could kind of be like oh yeah same right <laughs> it's nice for someone who had been has been struggling with bulimia or other eating disorder there was somebody watching that that's going through that like they were that's why people came out in droves because they were like oh my god that's relatable like she knows like what I'm talking about, like she's, Mm -hmm. like she's been through it. And then you have the people who, um, you know, they obviously didn't know if you were still going through it or, but they had been through it in the past and were just like, Hey, I'm here for you because Mm -hmm. they know what it's like. And we all know what it's like to be going through something really challenging and think that you're the only one going through it. I don't know. I, I enjoy talking about things openly because it kind of, it it knocks the fear of it. Do you know what I mean? It does. Um, because it's like, this isn't such a big and scary thing if we were all laughing about it. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, I mean, obviously it's, it's still a very serious thing. But if it's more out in the open, I just feel like it's just less of a, of a big demon. If you can make jokes about it, you can conquer it. And, like, we've all been in that spot where we've been too, I don't know if I want to say insecure, but just not ready to face certain things or... Mm. Like, I remember never thinking that I could ever be so vocal about being queer on mm-hmm. on social media. I never thought I'd be, and I wanted to, like, I'd wanted to make videos, I'd want to do this, and I just never thought that I could. And so the fact that, like, you, you get to a point where something that was once so painful is now something that you can make light about and make creative content that is relatable to people is huge. There's power in making light of it, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> there is there completely is I feel like another thing even though you haven't been able to get out and do kind of the the exercising because the gyms have been closed you do have a poll for pole dance <laughs> and I can see it in your videos and I and I love it yeah so um I started pole dancing at the beginning of uni so about four years ago 
Um, and since then, I'm actually a qualified instructor as well. I That's can awesome. teach classes. Um, and it's so nice to just have one in my own room so I can just jump up and train whenever I want to because it's such good exercise. It really is. And studios can be quite expensive. So to just invest in your own pole and have it in there. It's so funny though, because I always get questions in my videos. They're like, what is that? <laughs> um, but you know, I like it as something different in my room. Uh, but yeah, no, I've been doing it for years and I really enjoy it. It's super unique. It's, it's something that it's not just like, oh, like I'm a jogger. Like I, I jog sometimes. <laughs> like, you know, my, my, my three mile time is this, this, yeah. and this. You're like, no bitch, I pole dance and I got one in my room. <laughs> Like, it's cool yeah. because it, it has this taboo thing with it because of, like, you know, strippers and stripper poles mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And I was mm -hmm. afraid when I introduced you, I'm like, I hope she's okay with me saying pole dancer. So I feel yeah. like that's, that's better than being, like, obviously, because you're not, you, you aren't a stripper. It's, just a, it's mm -hmm. an art form to, to dance on, on that type of object. Um, yeah. I mean, as you can tell, I'm really struggling to make it, to make it not weird, <laughs> make it not weird. No, it's fine. It's not weird to me at all in the slightest. Um, so there's different styles of pole dance. Um, the one that you see in strip clubs is usually exotic pole or, okay. yeah, or Russian exotic, exotic pole basically cool. um, with uh, heels and stuff like that. And that to me is also an art form. Do you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. um, go get your money sis you know uh yeah. but oh also... i'm very pro that people are making these these women who are dancers it's an asset they're making six figures in miami and in la absolutely. like do what you're most talented at like people absolutely that shit, do it like i hate that it's seen as less than because it's not and i have many topics on all of that shit but yes yeah <laughs> All I would say, like, my feminism includes sex workers, that's all, but... Yes, um, <laughs> yes, 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 100%. Yes, yes. <laughs> well, um, there's also a sports pole as well, which is um, more the type that I teach. Um, I do both, really. Um, I've never done it in clubs, but I've done it in competitions. Um, and, yeah, the sports type is more, like, strength-based and um, flexibility-based and things like that. And um, I think if people, like, saw like the different varieties of pole dancing, their head wouldn't go straight to strippers. But I understand why it does, you know, yeah. because it's the, like the only like experience people have had with it. But I don't mind that. Like people are like, like um, oh, it's a pole. Like, are you like a stripper? And I'm like, <laughs> maybe I am. No, I'm not. But <laughs> I don't mind having that kind of ambiguity around it because at the end of the day, I've never seen it as something to be looked down on. And it's something that I really, really love. Um, it requires so much strength. Um, it really helped with my eating disorder as well. Like um, going to those classes um, a few years ago and doing that level of exercise really made me feel better about eating because like you become more body confident because you tone up and because mm -hmm. a room full of women who are all so body confident, even though their bodies are all different shapes and sizes, you know what I mean? You're in like your little sports bra and your shorts and everyone's confident as hell it makes you feel so much better. So that sport really helped me in that sense. I can tell just from, from being an athlete, how much core strength you have to have and how much arm strength you have to have to do that. Like mm. it, I, I admire it completely. Like I'm not a graceful person, but like, I would love to learn that stuff just because <laughs> I think that the body and the way that the body mute moves, especially mm. doing artistic and sporty stuff like that is beautiful. I love it. Uh, yeah, I I could watch it all day to be honest. But yeah, yeah. I do get some comment comments sometimes on my videos like, oh, like, are you gonna you'd, you'd never post your poll and stuff like that. I'm like, you want me to be more shadow banned? Like, what are you trying to do? <laughs> <laughs> like, dude, I'm black and queer. Like, let's not add the poll in there. <laughs> so guys, we have. We don't have a sponsor. This is the second episode. I, we didn't have a sponsor the first time. We don't have a sponsor the second time. But if you're a queer business and or you know any queer businesses who would like to sponsor us, hit me up in the DMs at Brie Logan. I also want to say if you guys are loving this episode, getting a lot of value out of it, 
please drop us a review on iTunes. This helps us get discovered by more queer listeners just like you so we can get this in the ears of people who are looking for some cool, relatable gay content. If you don't know where to find the reviews, if you scroll on the main page of the podcast on iTunes, you can see where it says tap to rate with the stars next to it. And then after you fill in the stars below that, in the bottom left-hand corner, it'll say write a review. So again, if you're loving this, uh, reviews are much appreciated. Guys, so we're going to segue into questions for the queers. So this is a part of the podcast where we try to answer your questions on life, love, and happiness that uh, we probably have no business trying to answer. (laughs) But we will try our best. Exactly. So if you'd like to submit a question that could be chosen for this podcast, please send them to questions at queertalkpodcast.com. Also, if you want to stay anonymous, please let me know when you submit and I will keep your identity private. So today's question comes from uh, Krista. She's 25. She's from Louisiana. She says, I recently came out to my family a few months ago. And by family, I mean my grandma, my mom, and my gay uncle, who is my mom's little brother. My mom and my grandma are making me keep my sexuality quiet from the rest of my family in order to keep the peace, I guess. Even though my whole family knows about my uncle who is married and has been for three years to his lovely husband, but for whatever reason, they're not okay with me being gay. I'm currently dating a girl, no official, not official girlfriends yet, but it's getting pretty serious and I want to be able to invite her to things with my family uh, present, but I can't and it's upsetting. I just want to know how to deal with it because it really sucks that I'm finally out and proud of who I am and the girl that I'm talking to is amazing and deserves to be shown off like the queen she is, yet I can't be out and proud to the people I want to be out and proud around. It's really difficult when your family's not supportive. I think it obviously it's strange that it's inconsistent with the uncle. Um, I know. Like, have, have, I'd like to know if Chris is like kind of pushed why it's different one rule for them and one Mm -hmm. for the other um I wouldn't I wouldn't like push going against your family you know like um but that's a really tricky one um I hope that the girl that you're seeing is understanding as well because um it's never nice to feel like you're being kept in the shadows what do you think I think that some tough conversations are in order, you know, I, Mm. I definitely agree with you. I want to ask like, Hey, you guys are cool with my uncle and his husband. Why aren't you okay with me? Mm. And, and really see what their response is and see if they even have a response or if they're just kind of like sputtering and trying to figure out why they feel that way. Mm. Um, Because it seems like, that everyone's pretty cool with your uncle and his husband. Um, and it, I would take stock in the fact that you do have that support. You, you have your uncle, which a lot of people don't even have that. So like, I would definitely appreciate the fact that you have like, a uh, somebody who is already gay in the family and has kind of paved the way for you a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, definitely get as much advice as you can. Um, Obviously your experience isn't going to be completely the same as, as your uncle. Um, But yeah, and I would definitely have a tough conversation like with your mom and your grandma asking why they're doing that. And also to let them know how that makes you feel like, you know, tell them why it hurts, tell them why it's invalidating Um, And if, you know, if you're not feeling seen and those kind of things, it's, it's a tough conversation to have. So like my heart goes out to you. So that's what I, I would take steps to do that. It's, it takes a while for family to come around and that's just kind of usually it just, it sucks that that's the case, but it, it does kind of uh, happen that way. Even a son to your grandma might be different to then your, your mom having a gay daughter. And it might be different to her, even though we can't understand why. There might be something that she's holding on to, some bias, like maybe she thinks that you're not going to have kids now, or maybe she, like all of these kind of like stereotypes. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. yeah. So maybe it is just another communication thing. Like she just needs to understand you and where you're coming from a lot more. Mm-hmm. Um, and just more common ground needs to be formed first so that before she can kind of feel comfortable, like releasing this to the family. Yeah. 
that is what I would say, Krista. We're thinking about you. We're here for you. Whatever happens, you guys, you have a community and you probably already know that from TikTok. So definitely yeah, take stock in the fact of that. Yeah. You're not alone. You are not alone. So Sinead, you want to answer some questions really fast? <laughs> yeah, I'm ready. Hit me. First thought that pops into your head. Are you ready? Uh -oh. Texting or talking? Talking. Dog or cat? Cat. Big spoon or little spoon? Big spoon. Are you the gay that swishes the bugs? No, I'm vegan. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the gay that goes to put them in a glass. Best movie to watch for a queer person? I watched Below Her Mouth recently. <laughs> Doc Martens or Birkenstocks? Neither. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, no offense. <laughs> Last song you listened to on repeat? When I Was Older by Billie Eilish. Giving presents or getting presents? Giving. <laughs> First celebrity you ever had a crush on? Ruby Rose. <laughs> if you could invite anyone to dinner, living or dead, who would it be and why? Um, Lacey Sturm, the lead singer from Flyleaf, or the ex-lead singer. It's my favorite band okay. when I was younger, and they helped me through a lot. So <laughs> I have some questions for that lady. Sinead, thank you so much for being on this podcast. If you want to check out more about uh, Sinead, you can find her on TikTok at um, R-E-A-1-L-E -L -E and S-R-B-X-O underscore underscore <laughs> on I didn't Instagram. make this easy for people, did I? I did not no. make this easy. <laughs> <laughs> and as always, you can find me on all platforms at Brie Logan. If you enjoyed this episode, please drop us a rating on iTunes and leave us a little written review. Helps us get discovered by more queer people just like you. So that's it for this episode. My queers, I want to leave you with this. Be you, be queer, stay safe, and we will see you on the next episode.